in the small, tranquil town of Keddy, nestled amidst the picturesque Sierra Nevada mountains. The idea of an unspeakable crime once likely seemed unimaginable. But in the early 1980s, the town's serene backdrop was irrevocably marred by a horrifying event that would go down in history as one of California's most baffling unsolved mysteries, the Keddy Cabin Murders. The year was 1981, a time when small town America still felt insulated from many of the horrors frequently reported in big cities. Keddy, with its rustic cabins and lush forested landscapes, was a retreat from the bustling world, where children played freely and neighbors greeted each other by name. But on the morning of April 12th, that illusion of safety was shattered. Inside cabin 28, a gruesome scene awaited discovery. Three members of the Sharp family and a family friend were found bound and bludgeoned to death. The brutality of the crime sent shockwaves through the community, casting a dark shadow over the once idyllic settlement and leaving a mystery that would haunt Keddy for decades to come. The Sharp family, consisting of mother, Sue Sharp, and her lively children, daughters, Sheila, aged 14, and Tina, aged 12, along with sons John, who was 15, Rick, a lively 10-year-old, and the youngest, Greg, just five, made their way to Keddy with aspirations of a fresh beginning. Following the turbulent separation from her husband, Sue believed that relocating to a new environment would offer the family a chance to heal and grow. Keddy, known for its picturesque landscape and a community where everyone knew one another, seemed like the perfect sanctuary for the Sharps. They envisioned days filled with laughter, new friendships, and the joy of small town life. Tragically, the dreams and hopes they held for their future in Keddy would be devastatingly cut short, forever marking the town with a dark, indelible stain. On the fateful evening of April 11th, the atmosphere within the Sharp household was typical of any close-knit family. Sue decided to spend a quiet evening at home, accompanied by her daughter Tina and her sons, Rick and Greg. Also joining them was the boy's friend, Justin Smart. Meanwhile, the elder daughter, Sheila, sought an evening of girlish giggles and whispers, choosing to have a sleepover at the Seabolt family's residence, just a stone's throw away in the adjacent cabin number 27. As for John, he was out with good friend Dana Wingate. The allure of the evening beckoned them elsewhere. They were believed to be out visiting friends, immersing themselves in the laughter and camaraderie of youth. As the night wore on, the pair eventually made their way back to the Sharps' cabin, either late in the evening or in the hushed tones of the early morning. As dawn broke on April 12th, the quiet was shattered by a discovery that would forever mark the history of this sleepy little town. At around 8 a.m., an unsuspecting Sheila returned to the family cabin and was met with a scene straight from a nightmare. The living room, a space once filled with the family's laughter and memories, had turned into a grotesque tableau of horror. The bodies of Sue, John, and Dana lay in chilling silence, bound mercilessly with medical tape and electrical cords. Autopsy reports later revealed the horrifying extent of their injuries. While Sue and John had met their tragic end from a combination of knife-inflicted wounds and blunt force trauma, Dana had suffered death by asphyxiation. Amid this grisly scene, there was a distressing absence. Tina was nowhere to be found, stoking fears that she too had met a grim fate. But a glimmer of hope emerged from the adjacent bedroom, where miraculously the youngest of the Sharp siblings, Rick and Greg, along with their friend Justin, were found untouched by the horrors that unfolded just a room away. They had been spared physically, but the emotional scars of that fateful night would remain with them forever. The brutality of the murders in Cabin 28 inevitably led to a swift response from law enforcement. Local authorities, unaccustomed to such a heinous crime in their quiet town, immediately cast a wide net, pulling in an array of potential suspects. Initial interviews spanned from close friends and relatives to more distant acquaintances and anyone who had any association with the Sharp family in the days leading up to the murders. As investigators delved deeper, they faced a myriad of challenges, from puzzling witness testimonies to unexpected dead ends. A couple residing in a nearby house reported being woken abruptly around 1.15 a.m. on the night of the murders. 
They claim they were met with what sounded like faint screams piercing the otherwise serene ambiance. These brief sounds of distress were enough to rouse them, but seemed to evade the notice of those closer to the source. Surprisingly, neither Sheila nor the members of the Seabold family, whose house was mere steps away from the Sharps' cabin, reported any out-of-the-ordinary sounds that night. Their proximity to the scene of the crime makes this lack of auditory evidence puzzling, raising questions about the nature and swiftness of the attacker or attackers. Even more baffling is the notion that amid the brutal onslaught happening in the living room of the Sharps' cabin, the two youngest Sharp siblings and their friend Justin remained untouched and seemingly unaware of the events. Furthermore, the lack of a discernible motive left investigators navigating a maze of uncertainty. Was this a crime of passion, a burglary gone awry, or something even more sinister? And where was Tina Sharp? Had she been abducted? The absence of any sign of forced entry suggested the attacker might have been someone the family knew. Several items, including Tina's jacket, shoes, and a toolbox were found missing from the Sharp residence. The house's phone line had been cut and its curtains drawn closed. Additionally, a notable detail emerged when several residents, including the Seabolt family, mentioned spotting a green van parked near the Sharp residence at approximately 9 p.m. on the evening of April 11th. Neighboring resident Martin Smart, father of Justin, soon became a prime suspect after mentioning a claw hammer had gone missing from his home. Sheriff Sylvester Thomas, in charge of the investigation, later stated that Martin had provided endless clues in the case that seemed to throw the suspicion away from him. His son, Justin, also created challenges for the investigators by providing inconsistent accounts of the evening's events. There's a very good chance that I had uh, witnessed something, um, whether it be the crime itself or the aftermath. Initially, he described seeing the murders in a dream. However, he later asserted under hypnosis that he had directly witnessed the crime unfold. According to him, he woke up due to noises coming from the living room and saw Sue with two unfamiliar men. Subsequently, John and Dana walked in and got into an altercation with these men. During the chaos, Tina entered and was taken away by one of the intruders. Sketches of these two men, based on Justin's descriptions, were drafted by Harlan Embry, an untrained volunteer. Oddly, instead of using professional forensic artists available to them, the authorities chose to rely on Embry. According to the sketches and descriptions, one of the men was taller, with dark blonde hair, and the other was of average height with black slickback hair. Both allegedly wore gold-rimmed sunglasses. Amid speculations, any notion that the crime was ritualistic or related to drug trafficking was debunked by Sheriff Doug Thomas. He confirmed that neither drugs nor related items were discovered at the crime scene. Tina Sharp's disappearance was initially treated as a potential kidnapping by the FBI. However, by April 29, 1981, reports surfaced that the FBI had scaled back its involvement, citing that the California State Department of Justice was handling the case effectively. Authorities launched an extensive search covering a five-mile radius around the house using police dogs, but their search yielded no results. Her whereabouts remained a mystery until April 22, 1984, when a person collecting bottles stumbled upon a human skull fragment and part of a jawbone at Camp 18, close to Feather Falls in neighboring Butte County, approximately 100 miles from Keddy. By June of that year, a forensic expert confirmed these remains belonged to Tina. Along with the remains, investigators found a blue nylon jacket, a blanket, a pair of Levi's jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty medical tape dispenser. In a puzzling twist, the Butte County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous call shortly after, revealing the discovery, claiming the remains were Tina's. However, this call wasn't documented. Intriguingly, at some point after 2013, a tape containing a recording of the call was discovered in the bottom of an evidence box by a deputy reviewing the case. In a 2008 documentary, Marilyn Smart, Martin's wife, pointed fingers at her husband and his associate, John Bo Bobity, hinting at their potential involvement in the crimes. 
she recalled an eerie scene on the night of the incident. After leaving the duo at a bar around 11 p.m., she returned home, only to discover them hours later burning an unidentified object in the wood stove. I heard noise and I did get up and I went to the bedroom door and I saw them burning something in the wood stove. This revelation became more significant when she made known that Martin also had a deep-seated animosity towards John Sharp. However, Sheriff Doug Thomas stated in the same documentary that Martin had passed a polygraph test when questioned at the time. In 2016, an article from the Sacramento Bee intensified suspicions around Martin Smart's involvement in the case, highlighting that Martin had reportedly driven to Reno, Nevada shortly after the murders. While there, he sent a letter to Marilyn reflecting on his personal struggles in their marriage. The letter concluded by stating, I've paid the price of your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. In an interview conducted around the same time, Plumas County Special Investigator Mike Gamberg stated that the letter was overlooked in the initial investigation and was never admitted as evidence. He subsequently expressed criticism about the competence of investigators, remarking, you could take someone just coming out of the academy and they'd have done a better job. Building on the concerns raised about the initial investigation, further evidence came to light that seemed to emphasize these oversight issues. Notably, the discovery of a hammer fitting the description of the one Martin reported missing. The object was retrieved from a local pond, with law enforcement suggesting that it seemed to have been deliberately placed there. Furthermore, a counselor whom Martin saw regularly came forth claiming that Martin admitted to the murders of Sue and Tina, suggesting that Tina was tragically silenced to ensure she couldn't identify him after witnessing the horrifying act. However, in April 2018, the narrative took a surprising turn when Special Investigator Gamberg announced that DNA evidence taken from a piece of tape at the crime scene matched that of a known living suspect. This shifted the focus from Martin Smart, who died in Portland, Oregon in 2000, and his associate, Bobitti, who died in Chicago in 1988. Despite these developments, the identity of the Keddy Cabin Killer remains elusive to this day. The Keddy Cabin murders linger as a haunting chapter in the annals of true crime. A family's peaceful retreat turned nightmarish and the echoes of that fateful night in 1981 still reverberate through the quiet town of Keddy. While subsequent investigations have shed some light on potential leads and suspects, definitive answers have proven elusive. The case underscores the enduring pain and uncertainty that families of unsolved crime victims endure and serves as a chilling reminder of the mysteries that sometimes lurk in seemingly tranquil settings. As the years pass, the hope remains that justice, however delayed, might still be realized for the Sharp family.